So I just finished watching the debate, the Monk debate, a few weeks ago between David Frum uh, and Steve Bannon. Frum is an uh, editor at The Atlantic and a former speechwriter for George W. Bush, and Bannon is uh, the former advisor to Donald Trump. And they were debating populism. They were debating um, the view of the future that Bannon has of the dismantling of the federal government and uh, the re-energization of the people, right, who um, Bannon feels have been weighed down by this technocratic uh, neoliberal state apparatus. And Bannon wants to empower the American people, which he claims is an inclusive category, but uh, the audience laughed at him when he would make claims like that because, you know, while there may be liberal forms of racism that need to be acknowledged, that liberals need to bear responsibility for, there are clearly conservative forms of racism that Trump's campaign style just unleashes. Um, he takes the leash off of a dark part of the human psyche, and it's clearly politically potent. So to pretend like um, the Trump vision for America is inclusive is is just absurd um but uh from of course when he tries to point out the immorality the anti-humanist and anti-liberal um you know values of the deplorables so-called hillary clinton's famous name for them uh the problem with his argument is that he has no moral ground to stand on right um as a member of George Bush's administration, I'm sure, and as the speechwriter, one of them, uh, he, I'm sure he wrote speeches for George Bush that talked about the need to invade Iraq because of weapons of mass destruction. And that turned out to be a lie. Uh, and so consider this in the context of um, Frum's article in The Atlantic a few days after the debate took place. I'll just read a paragraph for you. Um, he says that integral to the liberal project, again, the classical liberal project enshrining the rights of individuals and um, enshrining the free market as the space within which those individuals would realize their happiness um, and the role of governments just to protect free speech and free markets, that liberal project from rights uh, that integral to it is confidence in the power of reason. Words and arguments can overbear ignorance and prejudice, writes Frum. Over the long term, words and arguments can even overcome oppression and violence. That's why liberals in the broad sense are so uniquely horrified by official lying. How can reason prevail unless words connect to reality? How can we argue against people who will spread fictions, if serviceable to them, without a qualm? So here's from um, using words that I would love to mirror back to him um, because of what he did along with the rest of um, the Bush administration to push this country into war. In the debate with Bannon, he refers to the Iraq war as, um, I quote, a lost or unsuccessful war. So, you know, he acknowledges bad idea, shouldn't have done it. But why shouldn't we have done it? Well, because it was unsuccessful and we, we could have, if we did it better, we would have had a better plan and we would have won the war, right? But it's such a rewriting of history, right? It's not a, a, a failed or unsuccessful war. It's an immoral and illegal war, right? That's what actually happened during the Bush administration um, and the justifications that were used uh, to push this country into invading Iraq and the idea that you know the liberal project, which from claims to be um, trying to support here and to pledge his allegiance to, the idea that you know words and debate, rational debate, dialogue, that this would be what moves world history when uh, you know he was supporting a president who invaded another country under false pretenses with made-up evidence. Uh, you know, what do you call Operation Shock and Awe? Yeah, it's, it's a couple of words, but they're pretty Orwellian words. And instead of, you know, 
entering into dialogue with the people of Iraq to hear from them how they would like to determine their future. And I'm not saying that would be easy with Saddam Hussein, a dictator that, of course, the United States put into power. Um, with someone like him there, it's not going to be easy to just give those people control over their own destiny. But, you know, to not use words, but to invade and use bombs uh, and missiles and 150,000 soldiers doesn't sound very liberal to me. So I don't know if Fromm is the best defender of these values against someone like Steve Bannon. Um, but all I want to add to this debate is to say that uh, I think Bannon is right in his critiques of neoliberal capitalism, corporate capitalism. I think he's, he's wrong that nationalism is somehow going to save us from that. Um, I think Fromm is perfectly right in his criticisms of the Trumpian worldview as um, immoral. Of course, like I said, he has no ground to stand on, but uh, there are clear ways in which Trump is very deliberately drawing upon and, um, you know, pouring gasoline on and lighting a match above these really base elements of human psychology that, um, you know, may in fact be rooted in, in our biology, right? I don't want to say like what Steven Pinker and, um, you know, Jordan Peterson and, and other, others would, would claim like that capitalism and patriarchy and so on are justified because our biology doesn't let us organize in any other way. Um, I don't think that's true at all. I think they have a very ideologically shaped view of the, the biological evidence. So if you look again at biology, there's also plenty of evidence of uh, symbiogenesis, right? If we're going to refer to behavior in um, the plant and animal kingdom and the microbiotic uh, kingdom, we're going to refer to all of that as just competition. We're going to be missing you know, most of what's going on, right? Which we might call cooperation. If we're going to use the other anthropomorphic metaphor of competition, why not use cooperation? Or we could stop projecting and just acknowledge, you know, symbiogenesis, right? The fact that the interests of organisms are, um, they don't, organisms don't adapt to one another in a blind way, actually. Organisms have interests, and when they interact and transact with other organisms, their interests change, because those transactions with others uh, change them, right? So um, organisms co-evolve. They don't evolve as separate individuals. We don't live in, the, in a universe made up of windowless monads, right? Self-enclosed units that don't uh, interact in an essential way or relate in an essential way to everything around them. We live in a seamless universe. Everything is interrelated. And that's true of the way organisms evolve or co-evolve. And human beings, you know, we can enshrine the value of the autonomous, rational individual at the same time that we recognize that the human individual is um, an expression of a certain kind of community, a certain kind of um, collectivity, that you don't get a human individual with an autonomous, rational will if you just throw a baby on an island to be raised by, uh, you know, um, I don't know, pigs. So not to put pigs down, because, you know, there's, a, there's something about human nature and you know, uh, Franz von Bader, quoted by Friedrich Schelling, once said that human beings can only be morally superior or inferior to animals um, because our freedom allows us to choose to do good or to do evil. And if we do evil, we don't become pigs. We become worse, lower, more uh, base, even than, than a pig. Right? So it's an insult to a pig to compare a gluttonous human to a pig, or an immoral human to a pig. 
and the moral superiority of human beings. It's not to say that um, animals don't have value. The superiority of the human in, on this reading would come from our freedom. And freedom is a is a scary power <laughs> because we don't have control over it. It has control over us. Um, and all of our political systems are and, and religious systems are an attempt to get a handle on this power, the power of human freedom. And you know, in, in the modern secular period, the nation state became the locus of ultimate value, replacing the divine, um, the monarchy, which was the representation of the divine on earth. And the individual was empowered as the one who's supposed to partake of democracy, of the miracle of representation where we vote and our representative um, and, you know, sort of enforces our will in the creation of laws and the enforcement of laws and the judgment of laws and so on. Um, that's the dream of the modern nation state enshrining the rights of individuals. Um, but the dream hasn't played out. So Bannon's critique of the liberal project is valid. And Fromm's attempt to defend it you know, he's a neocon, but he's also a neoliberal. You can be a neoconservative about foreign policy and a neoliberal about economic policy. I mean, that's Hillary Clinton, right? And so Bannon's critique of all of that, of the military empire and of transnational global capitalism, they're valid. And so what, what you know, Bannon is right to say that right now, with this populist upsurge, we have a choice between socialist populism and nationalist, capitalist, uh, or uh, economic nationalist populism. And the thing is, if we go in the nationalist direction, what's to stop us from becoming fascist? What's to stop the Trump administration or Trump 2.0 if, if another you know, nationalist is elected in, in his wake, what's to stop it from becoming fascist if not socialism? Because nationalism is nativism, and nativism is um, the arbitrary division based on whatever imagined genetic uh, superiority um, of one people from another people. Uh, even if the idea is just the border, um, national borders very rarely have anything to do with the, you know, biological, biospheric, um, or let's say bioregional realities of the ecosystems um, of this planet. So the idea that the operative uh, border that we should be protecting is the nation state border, um, you know, the idea that that's the operative border in the context of an interconnected ecosphere of a, a planet that shares one ocean, one atmosphere, right? In that context, we need a more scientific understanding of what a border is. And national borders are too ideological to serve that function. Uh, so we need a new kind of identity, a new kind of human identity. I think we need to continue to value individuality the rights of individuals to manifest their own destinies. But I think we also need to recognize that there are certain social conditions that are necessary to foster individuals, to foster autonomous, rational agents, creative uh, personalities. You need a um, communal container that nurtures that type of human development. It doesn't just happen in a vacuum, right? We don't spring up fully formed from the mud as rational actors, um, we need to be we need to be grown and supported and nourished by our society, and that includes our family. But if our family, if our mom and dad, um, our parents, were not themselves nurtured and, and raised into healthy households in the context of healthy societies, then you know a family can't take care of a kid unless we're all taking care of each other. So to avoid the regression into a kind of nativism, this us versus them othering. We, we need 
our populism to be socialist, where we recognize that, um, you know, we need to be striving for equity in our in our societies. That human beings, each as individuals, deserve to have access to the conditions of possibility of becoming individuals, right? And under the capitalist system, we don't have that. We have uh, worsening inequality, right? In the richest city in the world, probably, a few miles from here in San Francisco, some of the worst homelessness you'll see anywhere. The UN was here and said that it's inhumane and, and um, illegal, according to their, um, you know, global courts and laws uh, for people to be treated like that. And yet there's also like, you know, Salesforce Tower and the headquarters of uh, Facebook and Twitter and uh, all of these huge Apple, huge transnational corporations producing some of the, you know, the most wealth, the wealthiest sector of the economy, right? Uh, how, how does this sort of um, splitting occur? And you know, Marx had an, had an analysis of the contra contradictions inherent to capitalism. And um, the economic crash that's coming is, is really going to um, speed up a process that's already moving a million miles an hour. And there's no hiding from the populist tsunami. And if, if you know, we don't get more alternatives to the type of rhetoric that Steve Bannon is deploying that are honest about the failure of neoliberal capitalism. If we don't get people willing to speak to um, economic inequality and class issues, then the nativists are going to win, right? So that's all I want to say. And just, you know, that there are deep questions about uh, what democracy means in the new media ecology within which we exist, where there are no um, filters. Like, legacy media, they're still trying to use their control over um, their medium to leverage their message. New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, Fox News, whatever, you know, they have their audience. And they're still potent sources of, um, you know, ideology and opinion making. But the way that social media and the internet has um, allowed people to retribalize so that there's not mass media anymore where, um, you know, the message that advertisers and that cultural elites want the rest of the population to have is what they're fed and they have no more channels to turn to. Now there are infinitely many channels. Now everyone has the tools to produce their own media, to make their own opinions, and reach their own audience. So things have been radically democratized in a way. And that's scary because it may upend our values and it calls everything into question. So now we need to ask these questions like, you know, if modernity was about the nation state and the individual, what is this new cultural epoch or civ civilizational period that we're entering into going to look like. If we don't want the nation state in power, if we don't want the corporation in power, if we need to recognize this necessary social context for there to be individuals at all, where do we go from here? And I think it looks something like, you know, Murray Bookchin's libertarian socialism, um, a kind of uh, politics of nature or of ecology that reads the science of biology in a different way that's um, not looking at the biosphere and saying, oh, see, like all the organisms are capitalist too, right? And it's just this struggle for existence among atomic individuals. You know, Murray Bookchin looks at biology and biological evidence in a different way and sees a lot of um, mutualism, a lot of um, symbiosis, and cooperation and that human societies also have that potential and he's he's not a globalist he's a localist and there's a way in which you know um, libertarianism and democratic socialism 
I think, need to recognize their shared interests and begin to um, shift us away from the dangerous extremes that we're playing with at the moment. So um, that's all I have to say.